he was motioning to uh, his pilot to show the effect of uh, their bombs on some Russian troops, and he got his pinky a little too close to the propeller. So this was his first opportunity to shed blood for the uh, fatherland. <clears throat> it was during this time that he had a chance encounter with this man, Oswald Bolke. Bolke was one of Germany's earliest aces and is considered to be the father of modern air combat strategy. Bolke told him that he was tasked to form the first dedicated fighter squadron and asked von Richthofen if he would like to join. <clears throat> the answer was a resounding yes. The unit became active in late summer of 1916 and von Richthofen scored the first of his eventual 80 victories on September the 17th, forcing down this FE-2B uh, near the village of Villa Pluish, not far from Cambrai. He went on to score on a regular basis and in early 1917 was given command of his own squadron, Yasta 11. <coughs> I guess I'm a little out of practice from, speak, from uh, speaking. This is a photo of von Richthofen taken uh, near the village of Rucor in northern France in April, uh, preparing for a mission. These fur-lined boots were personal and I believe one of these still exists in a military museum in Australia. Yasta 11 was one of the truly elite units in military aviation history. I like to refer to them as the 1927 Yankees of air combat. <coughs> there are several aces in this photo, including von Richthofen's brother Lothar, who is seated here at the bottom. And all the, his air, and although this isn't a triplane, notice that his air, aircraft is painted completely, well, trust me, even though it's a black and white photo, it's red. And I'd like to share a quote with you from his brother Lothar about the coloration of, of Yasta 11 and also later on what became JG1. Lothar wrote, it had long been our wish to have all airplanes of our staff will painted red and we implored my brother to allow it. The request was granted for we had shown ourselves worthy of the red color by our many aerial kills. The red color signified a certain insolence. Everyone knew that. <clears throat> it attracted attention. Proudly we looked at our red birds. My brother's crate was a glaring red. Each of the rest of us had some additional markings and other colors. <clears throat> we chose these as recognition symbols. Schaefer, for example, and this is, I believe this is a Carl Emil Schaefer here on the left, had his elevator rudder and most of the back part of the fuselage painted black. Almond rotor, and this is Carl Almond rotor here, um, had his white. Kurt Wolf, this is the diminutive Mr. Kurt Wolf, used green. And I use yellow as a yellow dragoneer, or yellow dragoneer, another form of cavalry. This was the appropriate color for me. It was very, this was, as I said, this was taken in April of 1917, which was a month that became known as Bloody April. Um, it was very bad for the, what was then the Royal Flying Corps um, because they were, their aircraft were hopelessly outclassed by the Albatross D3 and the superior power, firepower of having two machine guns rather than one, which most British fighters and French fighters only had one machine gun. During the month of April, the, in the Arras sector where Rucor was, the English had 25 squadrons representing 365 aircraft, and they lost 241 of those during that month. Yasta 11 had 89 confirmed victories with one loss, and that one loss was this man, Sergeant Sebastian Festner, <coughs> who was shot down by an aircraft fire on the last day of the month. Not long after this, Yasta 11 was combined with three other squadrons, Yastas, and Yasta is a contraction of a German word, Jagdstaffel, which basically translates as hunting squadron. Yasta 11 was combined with Yastas 4, 6, and 10 
to form a yacht group or JG1. And that was truly the birth of the flying circus, so-called because of the various colors of the aircraft as well as their mobility. And these are the squadron commanders of JG1 uh, with their uh, leader, uh, Baron von Richthofen, Kurt Wusthof, uh, Wilhelm Reinhard, um, Lowenhart, Eric Lowenhart, and uh, again, von Richthofen's younger brother, Lothar, who took over for him as squadron leader of Yasta 11. On July the 6th, 1917, von R was wounded in a dogfight with aircraft from the RFC while flying this, folk, this uh, Albatross D5 in Belgium. He was able to make an emergency landing but spent several weeks recuperating from his wound <clears throat> and many feel he was never able to make a full recovery. Here we see a picture of him at the hospital with his nurse, Katie Odersdorf. And the hospital was located at, uh, at, um, I'm drawing a blank, at, at Marco. This picture started rumors that he had gotten married, many of which made it into the press, and he had already reached celebrity status by now by his continued victories as well as his memoirs that had only recently been published. Uh, there is a, a belief in, in, in my circle, as I like to refer to my Mary band, that he was uh, carrying this photo on him when he died, but uh, by the looks of Nurse Katie, I think she might have been all business and was dedicated to taking very good care of her, uh, of her patient. April the 21st, 1918, found Yasa 11 JG1 outside of a small village on the Somme River called Cappy. Takeoff on that morning, which was Sunday, was delayed due to fog. And this is a very interesting uh, photograph here, and there's a bit of a story that goes with it. This is von Richthofen's dog, his Great Dane Moritz. And uh, the other man in the picture is the squadron leader of Yasta 10, uh, Eric Lowenhart. Um, takeoff was delayed, as I said, due to fog. And so, as happens with fighter pilots sometimes, people start playing practical jokes on each other. Von Richthofen was in a somewhat not abnormally good mood that morning. And uh, he had caught one of his flight leaders, Hans Weiss, napping on a, uh, on a cot. And he had kicked the leg out from under the cot and dumped him. And it was a big joke. Everybody had a big laugh out of it. Well, a little while later, Weiss saw uh, Von Richthofen's dog come by and he took, and you can't see it, but it's right here under the writing, <clears throat> one of the wheel chocks that were used to brake the airplanes. The planes didn't have brakes, so when they were doing their run-up and so on, they would put these large blocks of wood with a piece of rope on them in front of the wheels, and they'd use the rope to pull the chocks when it was time to take off. But poor Moritz, um, once he had the wheel chock uh, tied around him, immediately went to find his master, and so this is a picture of von Richthofen having just rescued his, his poor dog Moritz from the uh, evil wheel chalk. This is generally thought to be the last photo of von Richthofen taken alive. Clearly it's a pre-flight um, huddle. Okay guys, this is what we're gonna do. Um, you notice that several of the men are wearing parachute harnesses. As you can see on this man, this, this guy right here and this pilot as well. The Germans were the only pilots in World War II who used parachutes, and there were several who were able to successfully parachute from, <clears throat> from damaged or flaming aircraft. Von Richthofen was also wearing a parachute um, on this last flight. Shortly after 11 o'clock on April the 21st, 1918, uh, the patrol took off and began to fly west along the Somme River. Von Richthofen was flying this aircraft, this is the famous red triplane, serial number 425-17. Uh, 
and I'd like to take the opportunity to read you some specs about this particular aircraft. He had several triplanes he had been flying <clears throat> that spring, uh, but he had flown this aircraft the day before when he scored his 79th and 80th victories over two Sopwith Camels. The power plant on the Fokker DR1 was a 110 horsepower Oberusel UR2 nine-cylinder rotary piston engine. It was basically a copy of the nine-cylinder uh, Clerget and Lerone engines that were used by the, 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 the French and the British. Maximum speed was listed as 110 miles an hour. Basically, effectively, it would go at about 110. Endurance was an hour and a half. Uh, service ceiling was about 20,000 feet. Um, wingspan, 23 feet. Length, 18 feet. Height, 9 feet, 8 inches. Maximum weight at takeoff was 586 kilograms, or about 1,300 pounds. Armed with two 7.92 millimeter uh, basically 30 caliber fixed forward LMG 08 slash 15 machine guns. This is a uh, another uh, look at that particular aircraft and I'd also um, like to read a little bit if we if I can about uh, both the previous picture and this picture. Let me see if I can go back. Okay let's go back. A um, man by the name of Alex Emery, if you can see this, wrote the book on the Fokker triplane. And Emery says about this particular photograph, Rich Tobin's red painted 42517, seen in its final state of decoration shortly before he was brought down and killed. The narrow cord of the national insignia crossbars on the now white rudder and on the fuselage have been changed from the thicker type Balkan Kreutz. The picture's believed to have been taken at Bel Es Ferrum, where Rick Tobin visited the two-seater unit Flieger at Tylum 227, whose uh, sergeant major standing by the cockpit has placed two guards on the Rittmeister's famous airplane. The blemish on the fuselage fabric below the cockpit, a small inverted V, shows that this is the same plane um, depicted earlier at La Chelle. So he had had this plane for the better part of a month, but most of uh, March he was flying 152-17 and 177-17 as well. <clears throat> Arriving over the front, von Richthofen noticed two RE-8 observation planes that were from number three Australian Flying Corps Squadron uh, circling over the village of Luhamel. The front line at this time basically ran from the upper right corner of this picture between Saint-Laurent and Saint-Lisec and across to the lower third left corner. This was at, this line had just stabilized after the spring offensive called Kaiserschlag and the front lines were not nearly as defined as one is used to seeing um, in World War I photographs. There was no elaborate trench system that had been put in place yet. The opposite sides were dug in, but they were basically uh, working out of foxholes, for lack of a better analogy, that were supporting uh, reinforced strong points. Now this is a photograph of an RE-8. It replaced the BE-2 as the go-to observation aircraft in what was at this time the Royal Air Force had previously been the Royal Flying Corps. Von Richthofen and uh, Hans Weiss, who evidently had been forgiven for tying the wheel chalk on his dog, separated from the flight and tried to attack these two aircraft, but these were veteran crews and they defended themselves very well. Weiss got a bit shot up for his trouble and Von Richthofen had a gun jam in a bullet, a double feed in basically one of his guns. So they peeled back off and went and rejoined the rest of the flight who were circling over this stand of trees in, in the very background there. Happening upon the scene about that time were the Sopwith Camels of number 209 squadron that was stationed at Bertangle, which is a small village just due north of Amiens. 209 had previously been a naval squadron 
was number nine Royal Naval Air, Ser Air Service, but with the merger of the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air, S Air Service to form the uh, Royal Air Force, uh, their squadron designation was changed to 209. Now these aircraft were marked, they had specific squadron markings, 209 had a red cowling, had red wheels, and they tend to use the, the, the bars around the roundel. Also in, in uh, Allied aircraft, they, you tended to have a number on the top wing of the airplane, so that was how they were able to identify themselves um, in the air. Now on his first combat patrol, was this man. This is Wilfred May from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. His nickname was Wap May. Now I got this particular picture from his son, Denny, who's still alive. Denny's up in his 80s, a grandfellow. And Denny always said that his mom always wanted to know who Lucy was and that uh, his dad would never tell his mom. In my mind, Charles Schultz must have seen this when he was a kid and said, hey, Lucy, that's a great name. I'm going to remember that one. May's flight leader on this particular patrol was a pre-war friend of his, Arthur, Arthur Royal Roy Brown of Carleton Place, Ontario. He had told May to stay close to him if a fight happened and if he was attacked to, quote, spin out of it and head for home. May, of course, forgot all that the second the dogfight started. May gave a lengthy speech about this combat uh, to a Boy Scout convention in Canada in 1953 and basically said the second he got in the middle of it, everyone was flying around him and he just kind of started flying in a circle and just opened his guns up. And then of course both his guns jammed and when his guns jammed, uh, he started flying straight and level. Well, that got the attention of von Richthofen. Von Richthofen had made a career of taking advantage of rookie pilots and May had drawn his attention. As soon as von Richthofen attacked, May headed for the deck in a spin with von Richthofen in hot pursuit firing all the time. May ran out of airspace basically here on this side of the bend of the river by Saïd Lissek and started flying along the river, following the course of the river, getting as low as he possibly could. Brown saw his plight and dove from a high altitude to intercept, but only got a snapshot from the left. And that's an important fact to remember when we start talking about um, the events in de that are going to happen in detail later on. Brown flew on up the ridge and they continued on up the river towards this village of Vaux-sur-Somme. At this point, they are about a mile behind Allied lines. Now, this is a very small Catholic church in a very small French village. And eyewitnesses said that May was flying so low that he almost ran into the bell tower, not the weather vane, but the bell tower, and that both he and von Richthofen had to maneuver quickly to avoid a collision with the building. So this tells you the peak of the roof is probably only about 25 feet high. So that tells you how low they were flying. And of course they were barreling along, which at the time was a, a high rate of speed of about 100 or 110 miles an hour. Now they are approaching the bend in the river. Let me back up and show you where this is. So that there's Vosser Psalm and they're flying towards this bend in the river. And as they approach the bend in the river, several things start to happen. Von Richthofen's remaining gun broke, and it was, it was uh, ascertained after the fact that he had a broken firing pin in his one remaining machine gun, which is probably largely the reason he was not able to shoot May down, even though he was on his tail for uh, quite a distance of time. As he stops firing, he probably hears and starts to feel uh, the effects of ground fire on his aircraft. Now, there were Australian soldiers on both sides of the river. There was also a machine gunner about halfway up this ridge uh, by the name of Sardric, uh, Cedric Bassett Popkin, and we'll talk about him a little bit more. Uh, there was also a regimental headquarters here in uh, the village. And they were flying very low. When they came down the river here before they went up the ridge, Sergeant Popkin said that the first time 
that von Richthofen came by, he could only make a quick shot because um, von Richthofen was so close to me, but also because von Richthofen was actually below him. And he was somewhere between the road that runs along the river and, and the ridge, probably about a third of the way up. But they continued on. May knew at this time who was on his tail. There was only one all red triplane in that part of the front and realized that his only chance was to skirt up the, the ridge here and, um, and, and hopefully beat his fate. Von Richthofen continued up the ridge following the same path as May, but on top of the ridge, he made a U-turn and started to come back. Now on the back side of the ridge was an artillery emplacement that was being defended by two uh, drum-fed Lewis machine guns that were mounted on post. This being a Sunday morning, those of course were manned by the company cooks of the artillery brigade that had the artillery emplacement, Gunners Bowie and Evans. And you may have heard their names if you've seen any of the several television shows that have been made about this last flight. But eyewitnesses said that Ron von Richthofen came back about 100 or so feet in the air, got to about here when his plane suddenly, and I quote, reared in the air and made an immediate descending turn left. The airplane came down somewhere right in here, right across the road from this building, which uh, at the time was an, an, an active brickworks called the St. Colette Brickworks. The plane came to a stop against the pile of sugar beets that had been covered to dirt, covered with dirt to cure somewhere here in the foreground. The first soldier to reach the aircraft once it came to rest reported that the Baron muttered something and died. His death in front of the St. Colette Brickworks came two weeks before his 26th birthday. He was World War I's highest scoring ace with 80 victories and was truly the hero of a nation. Von Richthofen's body and aircraft were brought back to the to number three Australian Flying Corps Squadron who was literally across the hedge from 209 Squadron uh, because he had attacked them first and they had been the first to put in the claim evidently. Now this is not actual damage, this is the result of some aggressive souveniring. Now several parts of this plane still exist. Uh, this motor for a long time was at the uh, Imperial War Museum in Elephant and Castle in South London, but has since been moved to the Imperial War Museum uh, out at Duxford, Duxford Airfield, which is now a flying museum. And I did see this engine last summer. This seat was given to Roy Brown who was credited with shooting down von Richthofen, even though he never put in a claim. Um, there are, I think, at least one wing cross and certainly some other artifacts that are at Peter Jackson's museum uh, at Omaka in uh, New Zealand. Von Richthofen was buried with full military honors by the Australians in the village cemetery of Bertang. And there is, of course, a sign marking that fact there. Photos of his funeral were dropped over the German lines at night, uh, of his body and his funeral were dropped over German lines that night. You wonder who the poor fellow was who got that job. Now, the question is, who got him? And there have been several books that have been written about this over the years. The first one was written by a man named Dale Titler in the 30s, of course, with a lot of eyewitness uh, testimony because the witnesses were by and large still alive then. Um, there was a book published in the mid 60s, which was a book that my mom got me for my birthday, which set me down this path, although Snoopy had certainly helped me to start down that path, written by a man from Massachusetts named uh, Pat P.J. Caracella. And then in the 90s, there was a very well done forensically written book by a uh, English historian, a fellow I know by the name of Norman Franks. What's interesting about those particular three books is that looking at all the things that could have possibly happened, each of those authors gave credit to the downing of von Richthofen to Sergeant Pompkin, the uh, Vickers machine gunner who was uh, part way up on Moreland Corps Ridge. When they 
examined von Richthofen's body, he had one bullet hole that had entered his body right in the fold of his right armpit, and it had traversed his chest and then clanged off his spine and had come out under his left pectoral muscle. So it would seem that he was shot by somebody who was to his right and was below him, and probably while his aircraft was in a banked attitude. If you look at the people who had that kind of square angle on him, the most likely person would be Sergeant Popkin. In each of the, those three books, um, the authors arrived at the same conclusion. Now, there's, like with any controversy, there are people in all sorts of camps. Uh, Bowie and Evans certainly have gotten some consideration in recent years, and with all of the soldiers that were around on the ground, it could have been any one Australian soldier who was a really good crack shot with his uh, Lee Enfield carbine. So no one really knows for sure. Now we have a good idea of what happened on April the 21st, but the question still remains, why did it happen? Why did he break his own rules by pursuing too long, flying too low, and most importantly, failing to maintain his greatest advantage as a fighter pilot, situational awareness? A couple of factors that may have <clears throat> contributed. He had been in that area for less than two weeks, and that was the first time he had flown a patrol over that particular sector of the Somme River Valley. Also, he had been flying combat missions for over two years, sometimes as many as five times a day, at extreme altitudes in some cases, and under physical duress that comes with flying an open cockpit plane at 14 to 16,000 feet. And as I mentioned, he had had a head wound from the previous year that was still troubling him at the time. Often he would come back from patrol and have to go to bed only to rise a couple of hours later and fly again. On the day he died, Manfred von Richthofen was a national hero. He could have had any position he wanted in the high command, but continued to fight as any other soldier would have. The fact that he continued to fly <clears throat> basically in defiance of the wishes of the German high command gives us the best insight into the deep unwavering sense of duty that was his driving force. One can also wonder what role might he have played in post-war Germany if he had survived. On that note, one of the great consequences of studying history is not only studying the events of the past, but also their consequences. And here is a case in point, which I'll get to in a second. A few weeks before he died, March the 10th, to be exact, von Richthofen left a note in a sealed envelope with the JG1 adjutant Carl Bodenschatz, saying only, if I don't return, open this. Bodenschatz did so on April the 23rd, and the note named von Richthofen's successor to lead JG1 Captain Wilhelm Reinhardt, who had been the squadron leader of Yasta 6 for the past year. As the leader of Germany's elite fighter group, Reinhardt was invited to test fly new aircraft at the fighter trials that July in Berlin. On July the 3rd, he was scheduled to be the third pilot to fly an innovative prototype aircraft, the Dornier Zeppelin Lindau, which had duralum and skin, one of the first aircraft to use metal surfacing. The pilot who flew the airplane just before him was the ambitious, politically connected commander of Yasta 26, Oberleutnant Hermann Goering. Goering took the plane up, put it through his paces, came back, threw Reinhard the keys. Reinhard took the plane up, and as he pulled out of a dive, the top wing broke away and he died in the subsequent crash. One month later, Hermann Goering was named as the commander of JG-1, a position he held until the end of the war. Now, one cannot fully attribute his prominence in post-war Germany to this turn of events, but it is safe to say the credibility of being the commander of JG-1 certainly contributed. One also can wonder that had he had flown the aircraft third and Reinhardt second, how would that have changed the future? And uh, one last picture for fun 
This is the uh, flying full scale Fokker DR1 replica uh, at the uh, Air Museum, at the Imperial War Museum at Duxford. And I will be happy to take any questions. I'm sorry, JR. It was a good talk. Well done. <laughs> I guess I have to unmute. Um, and we do have a lot of questions in the chat that have been accumulating. So I'm going to kind of read through them a little bit. And you can just respond as best you can. Um, starting with Jose, who asks, were all the DR1s of the Red Baron painted completely red, or were there, there other colors? Um, he was flying. He was flying three aircraft during the spring of 1918. The serial numbers were 152, 17, 177, 17, and 425, 17. The first two only had the, the cowling and the tail aft part of the fuselage painted red. I think the wingtips on the top wing may have been trimmed red as well. So 42517, as far as I'm aware, is the only all-red triplane that he was flying at that time. Okay. Well, and as you say, it was, it was a way of creating morale, demonstrating some swagger, you know, painting yourself like a target, uh, a bright red color, making it easy to spot is sort of a challenge uh, to any other aviator in the sky as to, you know, what they're going to do about it. So, you know, it, it was... An, it, a, an inspired way of creating cohesion in the unit, I would think. Um, let's see, we have some other people are asking about places where you can find artifacts about Manfred von Ruckhofen, whether they're in Australia, are there any other museums that are out there that have kind of the, the Red Baron story as a centerpiece? Um, the uh, Peter Jackson probably has more artifacts and memorabilia than anyone. The, the, the white fur boot I mentioned is actually at the Australian Imperial War Museum in Canberra and has and, been and there the Peter for- the Jackson Museum is, this is the Peter Jackson who made Lord of the Rings. Yeah, at Peter he, he is a very big World War I aviation plan. He scratch builds authentic replicas. He has seven Fokker triplanes. Right. Seven. Now, there are several Fokker triplanes around the country. There's a man in Pennsylvania named Fred Murren who builds them. He, he has one of his own. He also has a Sopwith Camel they had to rebuild after he pancaked it in a cornfield. Um, there was a gentleman by the name of Javier Arango who lived in Paso Robles who had a couple of flying uh, Fokker DR1 uh, replicas, one of which I saw fly. Um, and, the, and, uh, be, and also be, uh, yeah. old old Rhinebeck in New York. There are actually a right. lot of lot of places. Well, a lot. I'd say a half a dozen, if not more, that have you know Fokker DR ones that fly. Whether they have a Ranger radial in them or they actually have an authentic uh, uh, rotary engine is the main difference. Right, and that that's something that that bears pointing out, and that is at least to my knowledge, and you correct me, there are no original Fokker DR1s anywhere in the world that, that are even that are intact, maybe pieces, certainly no uh, intact aircraft and nothing. No, no complete intact aircraft. There, are, there aircraft are aircraft that have original pieces. Everything is a replica uh, yeah, that's out there. Just about, and, yeah. yeah. And so there are some places with airworthy replicas and, and uh, JR mentioned a place which is the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome and what I just, you know, this is a museum out in uh, the Hudson River north of New York City on, uh, at, in Rhinebeck, New York, and this is their website, but that's a museum that has all uh, World War I vintage aircraft and, and others as well, and they fly like every weekend. So um, if you really want the ultimate um, experience of going to a uh, flying replica museum, the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome in New York is supposed to go. That's where they're doing uh, World War I aircraft, uh, air displays and things. Um, let's see. Um, good question by Jane, which is, were most of the German pilots from the upper classes? 
Um, yes, or initially, yes. Um, they were certainly all officers, but you know, pretty quickly there were NCOs like Sergeant Sebastian Fessner, who was a member of Yasta 11. I think um, it, it got more democratic as the war progressed. I would say in 1915, you could say that, although Oswald Bolka's father was a minister. Uh, no, Oswald Bolka's father was a school teacher, sorry. Um, but, you know, pilots like Werner Voss, Werner Voss was from a wealthy family. Um, if they had a, a fawn after their name and they weren't Bavarian, then they were likely from nobility. But it was very similar to, if you were the officer class, you were usually going to wind up as a pilot. And if you were a fighter pilot, you were probably almost always going to be an officer. I'd say 80% of the time, maybe 85% of the time. As the war progressed and, you know, Germany was in dire need of pilots, then you started seeing, you know, more guys get promoted from the ranks or actually just be grant, granted their pilots brevet as NCOs. And it's important to point out, too, it wasn't necessarily that there were a lot of people rushing to be pilots because it was this, the life expectancy of a pilot was like three weeks. Uh, yeah. It was exceedingly dangerous. And, uh, you know, they, they were definitely, there were a lot of uh, needs for pilots, but they were, for the most part, volunteers who, be, who worked through their uh, service career to become a pilot because it was so dangerous and, and likely to end in, in death. Well, as I said early on in the talk, the guys who, uh, a lot of the guys who migrated to aviation were cavalrymen because, you know, the cavalry was pretty much done as a, as a combat force, as an effective combat force in World War I once you got into 1915 and the, uh, and the trench stalemate really began in earnest. Somebody had a good question for you here um, from Gregory. What motivates you to travel and visit sites related to Manfred von Richthofen, and how do you feel when you're at these locations? Yeah, thanks for the question, Greg. I'm glad you uh, stayed up past your bedtime, buddy. <laughs> um, I, I've always, I was always the kid who looked at a history book and looked at the pictures and, and knew that those were real places where that existed. And I can't tell you how many times when I was a kid getting out the uh, the encyclopedia and trying to figure out where uh, Bertrand de France was or where Cappy was or where Rucourt Chateau was. It always interested me. And then I started traveling, um, but I never really made it to that part of France until 2005. And, and I, my wife is from Germany and we go to Europe all the time. But in 2005, that was the first time I really kind of made the, uh, the big pilgrimage and visited a lot of the sites, including the Somme River Valley, and, but also the, uh, you know, the, in, in, in Belgium and Flanders, where uh, he was staying at the time that he was wounded. I, it's a chateau on the Isar River, and I actually walked in and surprised the, uh, the daughter of the family sitting under a tree reading a magazine. And she said, oh, yeah, you're here because the pilots lived here. Yeah, go take, take any pictures you want. It's fine. Don't worry about it. But it's just the idea of seeing a place that I know existed and that were, were the, the history happened. Um, Jeffrey Shara, whose dad was a great Civil War writer, said, I always go visit the locations of the stories I write about. You just have to get your toes in the dirt to really understand the history. And that's basically the, the same thing is true with me. I just wanna be able to walk the ground and see in my own mind's eye how it could have been. Yeah. Interesting, inspiring. Uh, Richard had an interesting question. With no radios and a one hour limited range, were uh, Richthofen's missions blind hunts or was there intelligence that kind of clued them in before they did their flight planning as to where they were going and why? There were different kinds of, of missions. Usually what the fighter aircraft were trying to do was to keep the British observation aircraft uh, from getting over their side of the lines. They, there was a German term for it called Sperraflug, which basically means blocking flight. Um, they were usually assigned a sector. Um, they, they, they were always, the, the primary mission was always to interdict, interdict um, enemy observation aircraft. 
Sometimes you saw the observation aircraft and were able to attack them. Sometimes you ran up against other fighters because the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Air Force used to do what they called offensive missions. So they were sending their fighter aircraft over to the other side of the German lines, basically to force the German airplanes to engage them on the German side of the front so their observation planes could come in behind them and have free access to take photographs. So it was that constant battle for air superiority with the ultimate goal of being able to see what defensive preparations that the enemy had. And that was done not only with aircraft, but also with tethered balloons. Yeah, I think it's interesting how you have these observation aircraft going around at the beginning of World War I and nobody thought to shoot them down or until somebody decided, you know, we should send an airplane up there and shoot them down and the fighter airplane was born. And that was, well, I think the German this... Eindecker was the one that kind of dominated. Yeah. It. Well, the first guy, you know, it kind of originally the guys would just wave at each other and then some go-getters took a pistol up and so they're blazing right. away at each other with handguns and then somebody brought a rifle. But the guy who really weaponized the air airplane was a French pilot with a name a lot of people recognize, Roland Garros. And he designed a deflector shield that went on the back of the air, of his aircraft, a Moraine Saulnier, so that the bullets would deflect off and not hit the propeller. Well, evidently it weakened his propeller and he wound up having to force land behind German lines. Of course, the Germans said they shot him down. The French said he had mechanical issues. Well, that's just one of those things that no one's going to agree on. But what the Germans did was they took that aircraft, which they captured intact, and they gave it to a Dutch aircraft designer named Anthony Fokker, and they, who was a very young man, but very brilliant, and said, Tony, can you figure out a way we can fire through the propeller uh, without hitting the propeller or without damaging or weakening it, weakening it in any way? And he came up with the interrupter gear, which was basically a cog on the propeller shaft that would not allow the machine gun to fire while the propeller was in front of the gun. And once he had that, then he had completely weaponized the airplane. And of course, the Germans fitted it to the Fokker Eindeckers, which Tony Fokker was making, and guys like Immelmann and Oswald Bolka and Willem Frankel uh, basically had free reign to, to attack because the, the British were using two-seat airplanes with an additional gunner to try and compensate for that, and it just didn't work out very well. That's amazing. Well, we're reaching the end of our time. We did have one other interesting question, and that is what happened to Manfred's uh, brother, Lothar? Lothar um, survived the war, got married in 1920, uh, got divorced in 1921, and was a became a commercial pilot and landed and had a, a crash landing outside of Hamburg, Hamburg in 1922. He was transporting a German silent film star by the name of Fern Andra, who was actually American, but if it was silent movies, who's, who knew. And he and his other pilot got killed in the crash. And he was actually buried in the uh, Garrison Cemetery at, at Schweidnitz next to his father. And um, when the Russians took over that part, they just basically took, since it was a military cemetery, they basically took out all the headstones and turned it into a park, and the park still exists. There are a few markers left there that let you know that there's probably something up there. It's right across the street from the uh, train station at, at, at Schweidens, it's probably less than a mile from uh, von Richthofen's house. Um, but Lothar, the only sibling that survived was Carl Bolko, uh, and the sister survived. And uh, they all escaped to the west and settled in, in Wiesbaden. And the, uh, the von Richthofens have a family plot uh, in, in Zutfriedhof in Wiesbaden. And Monfort is there, but Lothar and his dad are not. Their graves weren't recovered. And his mom is there and his sister are there. Uh, von Richthofen, when he was originally buried in Bertangla Cemetery, was moved right after the war to a German military cemetery a little farther south at a place called Freekorps. <clears throat> and then in 1925, when Hindenburg was president of Germany, they removed his body from that cemetery and gave him a state 
funeral and buried him in Invaliden Friedhof in Berlin, which is on the banks of the Spree Canal and, and was basically Germany's hero cemetery through the end of World War II. And he remained there uh, until sometime in the early 70s. But what was interesting, and I still know how they did this, his grave was actually in no man's land between East Berlin and West Berlin. Invaliden Friedhof was actually in East Germany, and the East Germans actually bricked up the, uh, the uh, gate of the cemetery. But you can visit it now. There are a lot of other famous uh, aviators buried there. Rudolf Berthold, Hans Boudicke, Ernst Dudet is buried there. Um, you know, he died in 1941, but they, Carl Bolko finally got in his remains out and now he's, he's in the family plot in Wee Spot. Well, JR, it was fascinating to hear the lore and history of Manfred von Richthofen and, and uh, the story of the Red Baron. Uh, you can show your appreciation to JR with a virtual hand clap using the reactions uh, feature at the bottom of your screen and give <laughs> Thank a little you. clap there. <laughs> Thank you. And in the chat, one of our participants here, Gregory, also put in a nice short list of museums that have a lot of aviation uh, material from World War One: the Museum of Flight in Seattle, the Smithsonian, of course, the National Yeah, Park. Smithsonian has the old Champlin collection. One other thing I'll mention, Jeff, I, if anyone is on Facebook, I have a couple of groups on Facebook that pertain to World War One aviation. Uh, the broad scope, what is called World War One Aviation History, and I also uh, co-founded and co-admin a group called Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron. There are a lot of great pictures and a lot of great history. If you're on Facebook, I urge you to come visit those. They're both dynamite forums. Awesome. That's much appreciated, JR. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. And I would like to thank our Hangar Talk sponsor, Provident Credit Union. We'll look forward to seeing you in two weeks when we have Ross Ferguson here for Hangar Talk. Uh, exploring what's more fun, flying passengers or freight. So we'll discover the strange and interesting world of cargo flight. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe, and we'll see you here at Hiller Hangar Talk two weeks from today. Good night, everybody. Hey, Roger. <laughs>